Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, everybody, for coming. It's great to see so many uh, new, new faces. faces, exactly, yeah. and old faces. Um, sorry, I mean faces that I've seen before, not faces that are old uh, in, <laughs> in terms of wrinkles. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> look in the mirror, I get that feeling. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to my research team, to uh, Michael and Robbie and Chin and Nushon for coming and early and uh, working overtime and um, making a hospitable environment for everybody. Uh, I prepared some uh, speeches like a week ago, but I'm going to deviate from this, uh, at least in the beginning, because I think I saw a real good example of stigma this week. I did a Cafe Scientific here in 2011, uh, three years ago, with Heather and some other people. And it was on the subject of media and mental illness. And I've been doing a research project where I, to sum it up in one sentence, the media in Canada is not doing a very good job in reporting mental health issues. They're focusing far too much on violence, on crime, on the one isolated incident where somebody with schizophrenia kills somebody. And they're not talking about the realities of mental illness where most people make a good recovery. Most people are struggling along trying to integrate into their community. Most people are looking to work, are trying to work part-time, are trying to have families, uh, the same struggles as everybody else. The media are not reporting that. And since that time in 2011, I've come across a lot of journalists, and they come up to me and they say, oh, oh Whitley, you're, you're always criticizing us. You, you're never giving us a good word. You're always saying that we're doing a bad job, and we, we want to do positive reporting, and we're really interested in this. You have to give us a chance. On Monday this week, we sent out 10 press releases about this event, and we said it's World Mental Health Day tomorrow, uh, very important day throughout the world. Uh, this event, there's going to be world-famous speakers like Heather. Uh, there's going to be lots of people, um, uh, people like Francis, who's traveling all over the US and Canada giving workshops. Can you at least give us a few column inches telling us about the event? Can you maybe send a reporter? Uh, send out 10 press releases, and I, I don't care. I'm going to name and shame them on camera. Montreal Gazette, CJAD, CBC lots of other programs. How many phone calls do you think we got? None. Yes, thank you. And, you know, I have a lot of sympathy and a, a huge amount of compassion for people with, with breast cancer or with HIV, but I'm pretty sure if this event was about breast cancer or HIV that the media would have been on the phone the next day. And it just pisses me off. Excuse me, you have to bleep that out. <laughs> But uh, we've been talking for three or four years to the media about how it's important to please have some positive stories, please counterbalance the negative, please counterbalance the, the guy who's urinating in a, in a park, which just seems to constantly get in the Journal de Montréal or the Ottawa Sun or all these newspapers. But we got nothing, so that's where I deviate from the script. Um, but what I wanted to say in my script really was kind of what is stigma? And it's very important to uh, think of this question. and. and who is the best person to answer the question, what is stigma? The best person is somebody with mental <coughs> illness. And we did a research study in Montreal the last two or three years where we went to 60 people with mental illness from a variety of uh, men, women, variety of ethnicities, variety of ages. Uh, and we asked people in a very general way, the, the project was actually about recovery. We asked them, what is recovery to you? What is the biggest barriers to recovery? What are the biggest facilitators to recovery? And the biggest barrier in every group, whether young, old, middle-aged, black, white, Asian, um, men and women, was stigma. This came out, permeated every single interview. So what is stigma? I'm going to uh, read some of the examples here. Um, uh, a young woman said to, said to me, uh, mental illness is very, very badly viewed. 90% of people with a mental health problem have a lot of difficulty finding employment. If you say to somebody you have a mental health problem, forget it, you'll lose everything. This is another young man. I would not say to an employee during an interview, never, because I know the general opinion out there. People, they look at you differently all of a sudden. This was a massive theme across the 60 interviews. People saying they, if they went to a job interview, if they're in a job, somebody finds out they've got a mental illness, they're not going to get the job, they're not going to get promoted, uh, they're going to be looked over differently, uh, and there's going to be a lot of stress. Um, what, other, what other themes came out? Uh, this was a French-Canadian woman said to me, I wish people, especially clinicians, would stop talking to me like I'm a baby. That would be good. Some people talk to me like I'm 15 years old. This was another theme. We get that all the time, that clinicians talking to uh, people with mental illness like they're a child, like they're, they're a teenager. Uh, 
Uh, and this stigma is, is really, it, it prevents people wanting to go back to see a therapist or see a clinician. They want to be, people want to be treated like adults. Um, more examples. There's a lot of discrimination against mentally ill people. I get on the bus. People look at me strange like I'm some kind of weirdo. Another person. If there was one thing I could change, it would be the stigma of people in society judging me. Not only doctors, but people in general, like you, the person across the street, everybody. We heard that, people receiving stigma on the bus, in public, walking in a park, people receiving what in sociological language we call microaggressions, uh, which is a kind of posh term for basically a, somebody staring at you and giving you a disparaging look or uh, insinuating subtly that you're worse or inferior to them. Another theme that came up was actually stigma amongst friends and family. And this might be a surprise to some people, uh, but many people report that the people who stigmatize them the most are people who were once close to them, their own family members, their own friends. Um, a woman said to me, I remember friends knowing that I had a mental illness and they would talk like I wasn't even there. They were just being ignored. Uh, this fellow says, people do judge you. They say, look at that nut, look at him. Injections, shock therapy, this and that. He's a fucking nut. He belongs wherever because you are schizophrenic. They think you're a lunatic, that you should be locked up or something. Another guy said, people have fear. They think that man there, he has mental illness. He could kill us. They think he is not like us. You are lower than them. So really in, the que in, the, in answer to the question, what is stigma? That is stigma. Stigma is when you receive that kind of interaction with the public, where you receive microaggressions, you receive disparaging stares, where people avoid you. <coughs> when you're in a conversation with somebody, whether it be a friend, a clinician, um, a family member, uh, and people are avoiding uh, engaging with you, they're talking to you like a child. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, the examples of people on the bus, uh, general interaction. What is the impact of the stigma? This is really the next key question has a massive impact in terms of subjective experience and in terms of actual functional functioning in general society. Subjective experience, a lot of research shows that stigma can affect people's self-esteem. It can affect their sense of self-worth. It can affect their spatial movements through, through society. In other words, they get out of bed. They don't want to leave the house because they don't want to receive these hate stares. They don't want to be talked to like a child. Um, it can affect their service utilization. So if somebody has a mental illness, and this is a key finding, I think Heather's done work on this, that uh, if you have a mental illness and you go to the emergency room and you say, I've got a back problem or I've got a knee problem, they look in your file and say, oh, he's a schizophrenic. He must, this must be a delusion. Uh, and there's been many cases where people with mental illness have had this kind of problem and it's got worse and worse. And sometimes it's led to a really severe physical illness. Um, so we also see stigma in the healthcare professions. Um, as I've said, uh, my first example, we saw it in the media there. Um, we see it in healthcare, and we see it throughout society. And I guess um, what I wanted to do was to try and give some positive examples of what we're trying to do to combat stigma, to try and finish on a kind of high note. Um, myself, I'm doing two projects at the moment where we're trying to address stigma. One is working with the media, and, uh, and the example I gave at the beginning shows it's not maybe working as well as we would like to, <laughs> but we're trying. Uh, one thing that I've done in the last few years, I've traveled to more or less every journalism school in Canada, from um, Halifax, Dalhousie, to UBC in Vancouver, and many in between, uh, where we've, I've given lectures uh, in the panels with people like Francis and Heather um, to try and tell a new generation of journalism students how to report mental il illness and mental health issues, why it's so important to stick to the facts, don't speculate, don't, um, just because some event happens, don't say that person must be mentally ill. Um, to remember that m most people with mental illness, if you define recovery broadly, make a very good recovery. They might have to live with the symptoms, just as I hurt my knee playing soccer when I was 16 and it still hurts, but I can still walk, I can still have a job, I can still, integrate myself into society and same same for people with mental illness um, so we're working with journalism schools and we hope that will have a slow effect as that generation of journalism students goes into society uh, another thing we've done is we've developed a, a guide for current journalists called mindset and I only have one copy but it's available on the internet as a PDF and there's an accompanying website where there's lots of um, 
uh, videos, uh, which is really for existing journalists. And this has been sent to every newsroom in Canada, every major one at least, where in the guide we're talking about why it's very important to use moderate language, uh, to talk about the good sides of mental illness, um, to think about the realities of mental illness. Most people with mental illness want to work. Um, many people do work. If they're not working, it's often due to discrimination, not due to these myths of laziness or whatever. Uh, and um, it's having some effect. We're, we're getting it out there and we hope people are using it. We're going to follow up the effect as time progresses. It was only launched in April. Uh, and a second project that we've been doing here is uh, which we just got funded for uh, and the, the Canadian government should be complimented for, for funding this, uh, CIHR. Yeah. Um, uh, we got a large amount of money to do a, re a video project where we're going to work with three groups of people with mental illness. One group in Halifax, Nova Scotia, one group here in Montreal, one group in Toronto, where uh, we're going to teach people with mental illness how to use video cameras. We are then going to teach them how to make documentaries, the whole scripting, planning, production, and we are then going to set them loose into the community and make them make videos about recovery, about stigma, the problems they face. And we're then going to show these videos to schools, to journalists, to police, uh, to healthcare providers, to key stakeholders. Uh, and we're going to measure the attitudes of the people who watch these videos before <coughs> and after to see if this has an effect. And if it does have a positive effect, we're hoping to roll it out across every major city in Canada. Uh, I'm getting a one-minute signal from my uh, colleagues at the back there, so I'll just sum up. Um, uh, and to give credit to journalists, I do get occasionally get interviewed by journalists, and Heather does, and you know we make a column inch in the <laughs> middle pages on a Tuesday sometimes. Back um, page. <laughs> yeah, back well, if we're lucky. Um, yeah, I don't know if people saw today that there was the biggest issue in Quebec today. I don't know if people saw somebody's have been stealing cooking oil. That was on the front page of the, the major media outlets. So, anyway, <coughs> World Mental Health Day tomorrow, and people are stealing cooking oil. Um, and one journalist asked me, "Why am I interested in, in mental illness? Do you do you have a mental illness?" No, I'm, no, I don't. I don't have a mental illness. But um, yet, yeah, yeah, <laughs> dealing with this media. <laughs> um, but the way I look at it is that someone else's injustice is my injustice. Martin Luther King said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, and just because an injustice doesn't affect us individually, um, any injustice is an injustice to society. And if we allow that cancer of injustice to grow and grow and grow, it can permeate and spread and affect everybody in society. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, even though I don't have a mental illness, this is, a, uh, as, as Heather said in the beginning, this is an issue of social justice. Uh, and I really hope that everybody in this room can help and work together to try and combat stigma against people with mental illness. Thank you.